Hello, my name is uh, Matt Kurtz, and I am a professor of psychology and neuroscience and behavior at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, in the United States. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, introduce you to our uh, course, um, which is called Schizophrenia and Its Treatment. Uh, it's a course that's going to be focused on the psychiatric uh, disorder labeled as schizophrenia. And uh, it will be a multi-component course in which we review the um, psychology of the disorder, the neuroscience of the disorder, and studies regarding treatment uh, of the disorder as well. We will also have a section on history uh, and historical antecedents of our current uh, approaches to understanding the disorder and its treatment. Um, there are a few things that I want to say sort of uh, in an introductory way. Uh, the first thing that I would like to mention is that this is uh, in no way to be construed as an approach to uh, treatment for schizophrenia for individuals who may be watching this course. Um, if you suffer from the symptoms uh, that I describe uh, uh, for the disorder, um, I would encourage you to seek uh, professional help uh, immediately. Uh, and again, this is not a, uh, uh, an approach to treating the disorder specifically, but rather it is, an, it is a course focused on the academic study and the use of the scientific method for understanding schizophrenia as a disorder. So it's a uh, approach using the scientific method, uh, and this is in no way uh, an approach to uh, treating uh, uh, people with schizophrenia specifically. Um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to uh, just mention is that um, the course is largely based on a book uh, that I recently wrote. Uh, it's called Schizophrenia and Its Treatment, Where is the Progress? This is a copy of the book, so you can see it. And in no way is it are you required to buy the book. Um, you can get through the course without uh, uh, actually owning the book, but it might be helpful and might deepen your understanding of some of the um, uh, concepts that we talk about in the course, might help you to get a sort of a deeper understanding of some of the contemporary literature. Okay, so um, uh, I want to uh, uh, just begin by uh, saying a few things about, uh, about the disorder. We'll be uh, understanding the uh, academic study of uh, schizophrenia as it is defined by the ICD-10, the International Classification for Diseases uh, 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 version 10 that's been published by the World Health Organization, and uh, in terms of how it's defined by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Five from the American Psychiatric Association. So um, we will be using both those approaches to uh, defining uh, the disorder. While the uh, definitions in the uh, DSM-5 and the ICD-10 are somewhat different, they are largely overlapping, and I will be focus focusing uh, uh, more primarily on the ICD uh, set of criteria for, um, for diagnosing the disorder. Well, when you think about schizophrenia, there are really two things initially that, um, uh, two myths that, 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 that you want to dispel. And uh, the first myth is the idea that schizophrenia involves split personalities, right? I think that uh, we've all heard of this, um, uh, the idea that someone might alternate between one personality and then shift to another personality and somehow that this represents uh, schizophrenia. Um, this common misconception, I think, uh, comes from the actual label of the disorder. So schizophrenia, literally schizo means split, and phrenia means mind. So I think that has led people to the idea that, it can, that the disorder might consist of multiple personalities. I want to be clear that that's not at all what the diagnosis of schizophrenia represents. But instead, um, the idea of schizophrenia was, uh, came down to us from the Swiss psychiatrist by the name of Eugene Bloiler. Uh, Bloiler uh, used the term schizophrenia to describe a splitting of perception on the one hand and thinking on the other. So it wasn't a, um, a disruption in personality per se, but rather a breakdown in specific mental processes. And that's the way that uh, Bloiler had defined it. But I think because of those words, uh, it's frequently been thought of as uh, being a, a disorder uh, involving split personalities. The other common misconception is that people with schizophrenia are highly violent. And I think this uh, view has come down uh, from some very widely publicized cases. So there have been some uh, uh, very public acts of uh, murder 
um, in the past uh, in the past 10 to 15 years. Um, in the U.S., we can think of uh, the Gabby Giffords uh, shooting in 2011, uh, 2012, the Aurora, uh, Colorado movie theater uh, attack. And in both cases, the people who uh, performed those attacks um, had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And I think this has led us to uh, come to the conclusion that people with uh, schizophrenia are more violent than the average population. Uh, in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, uh, uh, current studies indicate that the rates of violence among people with schizophrenia just might be slightly elevated relative to the uh, general population. And there was a recent uh, a study by the MacArthur Foundation for Understanding Risk that in fact found that other psychiatric diagnoses that are thought to be less serious than schizophrenia, such as depression, may actually have slightly higher uh, rates of violence uh, uh, than in people with schizophrenia. The other key uh, thing to understand about, other key element to understand about schizophrenia and violence is that people with schizophrenia are much more likely to be the victims of violence rather than the perpetrators. And this is because uh, they often do not have a lot of money, they are uh, often unable to work, and uh, they uh, often end up living in uh, neighborhoods that might be more dangerous. And their cognitive difficulties and their symptoms may make them more vulnerable uh, uh, to uh, predators in their, um, uh, in their home environment. Okay, so um, what we'll be talking about today, as I mentioned before, is looking at what we've uh, uh, sort of understood about the uh, psychology of the disorder. So what we've learned about cognition in schizophrenia, concentration, attention, memory, those types of functions, what we've learned about emotional functioning in people with schizophrenia. Then what we're gonna do uh, is also talk about the neuroscience of the disorder. And this is a very exciting aspect of schizophrenia. This is where we're starting to learn more about um, uh, how does the brain operate in people with schizophrenia? What might be structural brain differences? That is the actual structure of the brain and how might that be different from people without the disorder? Similarly, we'll be studying activation patterns uh, in, in the brains of people with schizophrenia. And a lot of this work has been um, uh, advanced uh, by working uh, what is called a functional MRI, a technique for imaging the brain that has really just emerged since the 1980s. So I'll be describing very exciting neuroscience uh, uh, findings uh, from those studies. I'll also be talking about the scientific study of treatment, that is what randomized controlled trials using the scientific method have taught us about what are the most effective uh, empirically based, uh, evidence-based uh, treatments for people with schizophrenia. And we'll also be talking about the history of treatment uh, of the disorder starting from the 1890s and going up through the current time. Um, another uh, focus of the uh, course, will be covering all those different areas, but we'll also be asking the question why on the one hand, we've had such profound progress uh, in the scientific study of schizophrenia. In fact, the last 100 years have really yielded some very important and interesting findings. But then contrast that on the other hand with the fact that uh, most studies indicate that actual clinical outcome for people with the disorder has not improved a whole lot over the past hundred years. There's actually a uh, what's been uh, what's called a meta-analysis, which is a approach to pooling uh, um, quantitative data across different studies. And in one of these meta-analyses, it's actually been shown that if you look at outcome over the past hundred years, you find that rates of improvement remain under 50% and they remain largely unchanged whether you look at rates of improvement in the early 1900s, 1910, 1920, through the middle of the century in the 40s and 50s, up through the current time. The, um, uh, the findings are particularly notable in that our treatment for schizophrenia has changed so rapidly uh, over those uh, uh, 100 years. So in the first 20 to 30 years, uh, schizophrenia was treated largely through what's been called the fresh air treatment. The fresh air treatment came over to us uh, from Enlightenment ideals from Western Europe. And both in America and in uh, Western Europe in the early um, 1900s, uh, it was view thought that it was best to treat people with schizophrenia with um, basically beautiful, relaxing environments, bucolic um, uh, scenes where they could walk around in sort of relaxed settings and become better. And this was referred to as the fresh air treatment. In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, you begin to see the uh, institutionalization of many very uh, aggressive forms of somatic therapy. These included methods such as psychosurgery, where actually uh, parts of the brain uh, were cut out, 
And this also involved uh, treatments such as inducing seizures, right? Insulin uh, uh, coma therapy was one of the uh, common uh, approaches. So inducing comas or seizures was another uh, approach to treating the disorder in the 50s. And then you go up to the 70s and 80s with the advent of the antipsychotic medications. These are oral antipsychotic medications. And while they have undoubtedly had very profound effects on the management of symptoms in the disorder, outcome remains impaired even with uh, the emergence of that treatment. So part of the course will be looking at this discrepancy between on the one hand, all these uh, very powerful and fascinating advancements in our scientific understanding of schizophrenia versus on the other hand, our treatment data, which, su which suggests that many people with schizophrenia continue to have uh, poor outcomes and why there might be this discrepancy.